Welcome to the Healthy Gut Podcast with Rebecca Coombs, the place where you can learn how to achieve a happy, healthy gut. Here's what's coming up on today's show. Welcome to episode 48 of the Healthy Gut Podcast. Today, I'm really excited to be joined by Lisa Hendrickson-Jack, who is a fertility awareness educator and has been charting her own menstrual cycles using the fertility awareness method for the past 15 years. She's passionate about helping women to develop body literacy by understanding their natural cycles. After struggling with excessively heavy and painful periods for years, Lisa discovered the connection between health and fertility firsthand. Her personal experience of overcoming a Hashimoto's diagnosis and uterine fibroids has influenced her practice immensely. Lisa created her weekly radio show, The Fertility Friday Podcast, to connect women with a deeper understanding of how fertility and overall health are connected and intertwined with their menstrual cycle health. The number one response from her listeners is always, why didn't anyone teach us this stuff when we were growing up? And I know I have said that to her many times. Her mission is to share the message of body literacy with as many women as possible. Each week, she conducts in-depth interviews with professionals who specialize in helping women to restore their fertility naturally. And I came across Lisa because of her own podcast. I have um, often shared my own struggles with my fertility and the fact that I have endometriosis. And a friend put me onto her podcast and I found it amazing. I ended up going on to do her program. And I really am someone that says all the time, why didn't I know this sooner? Especially for someone who considers themselves quite literate when it comes to the the body. Today we talk about the connection between gut health and a woman's menstrual cycle. And obviously, ladies, this is one for you to have a listen to. But guys, don't tune out. It's fascinating. If you've got any women in your life that are still in, at a fertile age, it's really interesting to know just the impact that our food, our diet, our gut health, our hormones and all the rest can play on our fertility. It's a fascinating show and I'm sure you will enjoy listening to Lisa Hendrickson Jack and I talk all about gut health and fertility. Welcome to the Healthy Gut Podcast, Lisa Hendrickson Jack. It's so exciting to have you on the show today because I have listened to you for a long time on your own podcast and it's really great to have you on my podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Rebecca. I'm so excited to be here with you. Yeah. So for the listeners that um, may not have um, discovered all the brilliance of your podcast, all the work that you do around fertility, <laughs> I'd love for you to start off by just talking about a little bit about what you do and why you got into it. Well, thank you so much. You are so sweet. Um, well, my podcast is the Fertility Friday podcast, and I started it about two and a half years ago, almost three years here now, which is crazy. Um, but I started it for a number of different reasons. The first reason that I started it was because I have a background in fertility awareness. I am one of those rare people who learned the fertility awareness method when I was about 18 or 19 years old. So um, I've never actually used hormonal birth control for contraception. And so throughout my life, I was able to not only learn the method, but use it and have access to hormone-free birth control all these years. And, you know, I'm 34 now, so that means I've been using um, fertility awareness for 15 years plus. And so, I mean, that's just kind of my personal background. I was always really skeptical about hormonal birth control. Uh, I saw my mom really struggle with fibroids and a number of my aunties also. And so it's definitely in the family. We have pretty genetic predisposition to this fibroids thing. And I was always concerned that I might have trouble getting pregnant. I also had really, really heavy, painful periods. They were so, so painful that um, I have two children now, um, ages two and four. And when I was in labor (laughs) with my first son, I didn't think I was in labor because I was like, man, my period cramps are worse than this. So my period cramps were really, really bad. And um, so, I mean, fast forward to when I did have my son, I started to realize in my early 30s that 
you know, there's, this is the age where a lot of, a lot, a lot of women are, are trying to get pregnant and, you know, everyone's always talking about babies and my girlfriends are getting pregnant. And I realized that, you know, for all the women out there that are trying to conceive unsuccessfully, I felt like I was one of the few people who actually really truly understood the menstrual cycle. And I take it for granted because I've been doing it for so long. Like I know exactly when I'm fertile. I know exactly when I'm not. And when we were trying to conceive, it was just really quite simple for me just to like switch it up. So instead of avoiding unprotected sex on those days, I was just switching it up. And um, I realized that that I was taking this knowledge for granted and I actually felt compelled to share it. I, I had a number of close friends who I saw go through some serious fertility challenges and I couldn't help but wonder if their experience would have been different if they had had this access to this knowledge and information, you know, from a younger age like I did. And so that is the the long and short of why I felt compelled to start my podcast. Wonderful. And and I'm I stumbled across your podcast actually. Um a good friend of mine had been listening to you for a while and she I think had listened to an episode where you were talking about endometriosis, which I have have was diagnosed with endo when I was in my early twenties. And like you had suffered I had horrendous um periods. And in, in fact I have joked many times that if I was to ever have a baby, which I haven't yet gone done not sure if I will but um, if I was to ever do that and go through labor that the labor would probably be much easier than the period pain and the abdominal pain from SIBO that I've experienced in my life <laughs> so, and I know there's <laughs> other people in the SIBO community that feel the same they're like oh I don't think labor or childbirth could be nearly as bad as what I go through. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I would I would say that you're probably right because having gone through labor, I mean, there is a point where labor gets worse than the pain, but it's towards the end of it, to be honest with you. Like it's so I I, yeah. I believe you because it is that bad. I think that it's a tragedy that we don't take period pain seriously because it's that bad. Or it can be, I should say. Yeah, it is. It can be horrendous. I used to be bedridden for a day or two days. If I didn't get um, the painkillers in within 15 minutes of my period starting when I was younger, I literally had a 15-minute window, and that included if I was asleep and the period started. I would then be vomiting for an entire day, if not two, and just be gripped with the most intense uh, waves of cramps. And I used to, you know, think, how is this supposed to be normal? This is just hell on earth. But it's funny, my all the women in my family have had difficult periods. And so they thought that was normal because no one really talked about it. And my mum used to say, you know, oh, I'm so, it's such a shame, darling, that you've kind of got the family curse. And so when I was, I was 11 when I first had my um, period. And so, you know, I've had it for more, you know, most of my life. Um, and it was only by chance that it was discovered that I had had endometriosis. I was having, um, I had pre a precancerous cervix um, scare and I had some treatment, some lasering treatment done on that. And it, I just didn't stop bleeding from it. For six months, I was having some form of bleeding every day. And so finally, they did some further investigation and discovered I had endometriosis. And that was in my, I think I was about 22, 23 at the time. So I'd been dealing with these horrific periods for, you know, 11, 12 years um, by that point. And it was only then that I finally had an answer as to why things had been so bad. I just thought, oh, well, that's what being a woman is all about. But we don't actually need to feel that sick, do we? Yeah, no. Um, no, I think that just given my personal experience with period pain. Now, my experience with pain was bad, but it, it wasn't to the same degree. I have never, I, I wouldn't vomit, but it was uh, the window <laughs> um, is real. So I also had a window. And if the if I didn't take the drugs within the window, it, you could just write off the rest of the day. Um, I remember I had a boyfriend in university and like he, when I had the pain and I'm like on the floor, like crawling around like, groaning and rolling around and stuff like that like he literally just stood there he had no idea what to do he was just like I, like I don't even know like what to do with you so it's 
my heart goes out to you, Rebecca, because it just, I, I can't imagine what it would be like to have it worse than I did. And you had it much worse than I did. Yeah, and and my poor sister has it as well. So you know we're 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 a family of women with just hell on earth once a month. Um, one of the reasons why I started to get interested in fertility and why I've invited you on the podcast today was as I went through the journey of um, learning about gut health, discovering I had this thing called SIBO and um, and really starting to peel back the layers. I had been on some form of hormonal contraception, my almost my whole life. You know, in my late teens, I went, I was put on something just to try and control the pain and the heaviness of the periods. You know, I used to feel like Niagara Falls occurred within me every month, (laughs) and um, which was, you know, it's not a, it's not a fun way to live life as a young woman. And um, so my naturopath suggested that perhaps coming off the pill um, would help just give my body a break. Um, and she used to say to me, it's like putting a sledgehammer to your ovaries. You're just, you're you're whacking your system with such strong synthetic hormones that it would be, you know, if we can get you into a more natural state, let's do it. So I came off um, the pill and I was terrified of falling pregnant because I had not learnt very much about fertility awareness. Um, but my through my treatment with SIBO, my period started to improve and that made me think, oh, okay, there's, you know, what what is at play here with gut health and fertility? My endometriosis had improved, which also can happen with age. Um, and I started to become quite interested in it and then found your podcast, really loved listening to your episodes, particularly thing on things around endometriosis and PCOS and acne. And we'll talk more about that on this episode as well. Um, but I realized that I just didn't know very much at all and uh, that my fertility and my gut health seemed to be quite linked with each other. Um, Are you able to sort of talk about why and how um, our health and our gut health can be linked with what's going on with our reproductive organs? Well, absolutely. There's so many different um, ways that we could talk about it. I feel like one of the things that to start with, one of the things that I say all of the time, and it's one of the things that I learned when I first started learning about my menstrual cycle and the fertility awareness method, is that your menstrual cycle, you can think of it as a vital sign. And so, you know, a vital sign is a measure of, of, of your health. So the ones we think of that come to mind are like your heart rate, your pulse, um, your rate of breathing, those types of things. So you can go to the doctor and they can test your, um, they can test your vital signs and give, get a pretty good sense of how you're doing. Um, But your menstrual cycle, many practitioners in the field that I work in um, would categorize the menstrual cycle as the fifth vital sign, meaning that just like your pulse and uh, your breathing rate and your temperature and all these different types of vital signs, your menstrual cycle reflects back to you your health status. And so what's interesting is that one of the things, you know, that you were talking about earlier is just but how we just don't learn about our menstrual cycle and also how you thought that it was just normal to have pain with menstruation. And, you know, I, I did too. I think most of us just think it's normal. Um, but there's always a, a part of us that feels like it shouldn't hurt like this. Like this doesn't, although I'm told that this is normal, like if men experience this type of excruciating pain on cyclical basis, there would be like, um, I don't know, there'd be like dog teams being sent out to figure this stuff out they wouldn't stand for it. Um, But back to the menstrual cycle being the fifth vital sign. So what this comes to and how the menstrual cycle is then related to your gut health, but not just your gut health, um, all different types of your health. uh, The reason that it's related is because our menstrual cycles are a central part of not only who we are and our emotions, because uh, our, hor- our hormonal cycle is related to our emotions. And so it's not only related to who we are, but it's also related to and interrelated to every system in the body. And so as you know, um, because of your personal experience and professional experience with how important gut health is, if your gut isn't operating properly, if you have dysbiosis, if you have SIBO, SIBO if you have some sort of overgrowth um, or if you have a leaky gut, then you're, you know, you're not processing things properly. 
And your hormones, in order for your body to produce hormones, you need to have a, a functioning gut. Um, so the connection is is quite... I think that when you start paying attention and monitoring the menstrual cycle, it's actually quite surprising how intimately the gut is connected. So, you know, for me, I'm a fertility awareness educator, a holistic reproductive health practitioner. And so not only do I teach women to chart, but I support women in using their menstrual cycle as a tool to help figure out what's going on with their overall health. And so there's certain trends that show up on a menstrual cycle chart when you're paying attention and if you do have gut issues. So for those of you who are like, well, you know, what's this fertility awareness thing? What's this <laughs> menstrual cycle charting thing? Um, fertility awareness is essentially uh, paying attention to your three basic fertility signs. And so that being your basal body temperature. So your temperature when you first wake up in the morning, you take that and you you know, write it down on your chart so you have a record of it. You pay attention to your cervical mucus observations. And so throughout your cycle, your cervix actually produces mucus in response to the different hormone levels. And so you can pay attention to that. And also your cervical position changes. And so you would be so surprised to see that the way that your signs present on your chart are dramatically affected by your gut health. So I'll give an example. Um, I've had a number of clients who have uh, some sort of gut issue. So whether that's IBS, whether it's Crohn's, but something, some sort of gut issue where whenever they eat a certain type of food, they have a, a quite a serious reaction. Um, and typically when I get a client and they have this issue and we start charting, you'll see mucus patterns that reflect that. So when you get a deeper understanding of what's happening with your menstrual cycle, you start to understand that there are actually, there's such a thing as a normal, healthy menstrual cycle. <laughs> In a normal, healthy menstrual cycle, you have, um, you know, a period that is not painful, that doesn't go on forever, that isn't flooding. There's a certain type of, a certain amount of bleeding that is considered to be normal. So we pay attention to if you're bleeding more or less. Um, and then you're supposed to have several days before you have your mucus observations and then a certain number of days of mucus. And then you're, you, you know, after you ovulate, um, then your menstrual cycle, you would expect to come, your period, you would expect to come about 12 to 14 days after. So there's the concept of like, this is what a healthy menstrual cycle looks like. But when you have gut issues, for example, all of a sudden those parameters are, are just thrown off and you start to see mucus that does not fall within those parameters. You start to see, um, I've seen clients that have irregular bleeding throughout their cycles. And then once we start to address the gut issues, we see some of these things shift and clear up. So I'll stop because I could obviously talk for quite a while, but um, yeah, I'll stop and let you uh, jump in there, Rebecca. One of the things that I've found really fascinating was um, so I started list to listening to your podcast and realized that even though I thought I knew quite a lot about my reproductive cycle and and my own fertility I realized I knew nothing <laughs> and I you know I'd heard about cervical mucus observations and I was a bit grossed out by the whole <laughs> word I'm like Ugh, mucus <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> and I'd heard about taking your temperature, but I didn't really know when or how you were supposed to do it. And um, and so you you were um, you have a, an amazing fertility awareness coaching program, which I was like, you know what, I'm not going to waste my time and try and figure it out myself. I'm just going straight to the best, and I'm going to <laughs> and I'm going to let Lisa teach me how to do it. And what I have found absolutely incredible is just how clear our body um, is at telling us what's going on and once you get your head around you know all of all of these observations it's like having a little window into the body's functioning it's fascinating and it's very clear then the body tells you i feel you know very clearly hey i'm i'm cruising along pretty happily or well things have been a bit tough this month and where i found it particularly interesting was, um, you know, coming off the back of my – or going into my big U.S. tour, uh, which I did recently, and traveling around the U.S. and uh, Canada for a month, I was obviously on two very long-haul flights coming from Australia, flying in and out of LAX. Um, I'm changing time zones every 
you know, gosh, it felt like every few days I was changing to a different time zone, a big time zone change going from Australia to the States, eating different foods to what I normally ate, eating a lot more carbohydrates than I normally have, um, having more alcohol than I would normally have. And my cycle, which I'd become um, you know, I'd only been charting for a few months and that was really um, because of, thanks to you, but I could see very clearly as I started to chart through this um, tour period how it was having a direct impact on my cycle. And because I was eating, I guess, more relaxed to how I would normally eat, my good quality fats had decreased from my diet, a lot more carbohydrates had appeared, which also equals sugar, Um my period was a lot more painful than it was. My symptoms were more pronounced. My my observations through the month changed. It was so interesting. And there was a direct response to what was happening in my life. Yes. And what's interesting too, Rebecca, is that you'll remember in the group, we talked about that because I remember telling you, because I think you asked me, you were like, how can I prepare for this trip? How can I, um, is there anything I should know when I'm going into charting it? And we specifically spoke about that. So that's something that comes up in every group that I do um, and every client one-on-one um, coaching session that I have, because this is this is the tool. It's kind of like, this is why I started the podcast. That is the reason. Because every woman has the right to know that that she has this within her, this amazing tool. And the way that you described it is exactly what it is, which is that your cycle responds to what's happening. And so it's going on all the time. When you start unless you're on hormonal birth control and then it's not going on because hormonal birth control suppresses your cycles. So when you're not on hormonal birth control, your cycle is reflecting to you all the time what's happening in your body. So what happens when I'm working with women and we, the first stage is of course, as you know, learning how to chart and getting the lingo down, figuring out how to categorize mucus, like what color is it? Is it stretchy? How much is it stretch? Like once we get past the basics, then what starts to happen is like anything you watch and you pay attention to, you're going to focus on. So typically my clients come to me, whether it's just because they want to learn to chart, maybe they want non-hormonal birth control that they can rely on. Um, A lot of women come to me because they're trying to conceive and they want to understand their cycles better and really try to pinpoint if there's something going on. And so you get into a stage where you start to notice. So you come to me, just like the example that I gave you for some of my clients who have gut challenges, it's, it's actually incredible how many women struggle with IBS and different gut health issues uh, and consume gluten all the time, <laughs> consume, consume the exact thing that, that causes their gut the most distress. And so that's a good example of something where, you know, we have this chart, we can see what's going on. It's a really good baseline. And then we start to identify, okay, do you know what you're sensitive to? Should we get that checked out? Whatever the case is, we start removing some of those foods that you're sensitive to. And lo and behold, the chart starts to cooperate. Lo and behold, you know, period symptoms start to diminish. Sometimes it happens that quickly. Sometimes it takes a bit longer. Um, Mucus patterns start to stabilize and things like that. Um, And then eventually you get to a point where you can, it's, it's kind of like you can do experiments on yourself. So, you know, well, you know, I've avoided dairy for a couple of months now, if dairy is an issue for you, let me see what happens if I, you know, throw in a little bit. And quite literally, you get this real time feedback of how these things affect your cycle. So, you know, alcohol, sleep deprivation, travel, all of those, <laughs> all of those things will show up on your chart. And so then you get this amazing printout, this reading of what's happening in your body. And that gives you such a sense of empowerment because now you know if I drink this or whatever, it's going to affect my cycle in these ways. And then you get to make an informed choice, whatever you do, you, you know how it's going to affect you and you know that it is making a difference. I found it fascinating um, charting and I've got to be honest, I didn't do the full, I didn't do all of the um, observations. I found it really hard to take my temperature every day because I just, like most of the time I was waking up and racing off to whatever it was I I was doing. I didn't have the 10 minutes in the morning to just, you know, take my temperature. Whereas now I'm home and I just, it's a really lovely kind of way to ease into the day as you just lie there taking your temperature. (laughs) It's really easy. (laughs) I use it as my kind of meditation moment. Um, But it it was fascinating because there was a very clear correlation between, okay, stress 
and travel is very stressful and changing time zones is very stressful. I had terrible um, jet lag. I did not sleep well for the first 10 days at all. So that's really stressful on the body. And my cycle showed it. It was like, hey, hey, woman, <laughs> it's, it's tough down here. <laughs> um, what are some signs that we can look for to tell if our cycle um, is working correctly, if you like, in sort of talking marks? Um, well, I think a good way to to answer that question is to talk about what a normal healthy cycle looks like. Because, I, you know, one of the most basic pieces of information, right, that all of us should know is what that is, the concept of it. Because um, what happens so often, as you know, is that you have a cycle that's wonky. Maybe you're not ovulating regularly and you go to your doctor and you say, you know, I'm not ovulating regularly. What is the problem? And your doctor may, you typically will say one of two things, either, yeah, that's totally fine, <laughs> even if it's not fine. Um, or, well, just go on the pill and that'll regulate your cycles, which it doesn't do. Um, so we can talk about that too a little bit more. Um, so basically... The way to gauge a healthy cycle, whether a cycle is healthy or not, has a lot more to do with um, with the different stages of your cycle and not just the date. So it's not only the number of days. So I think the first thing is that your cycle does not have to be 28 days to be healthy because I feel like that's what we're always told. We're told that a healthy cycle is 28 days and it gives the impression that anything that is not 28 days is problematic and irregular. So a healthy cycle ranges anywhere from 25 to 35 days in length. And what makes the length part of it, whether that is normal or not, what we're looking at is how much does it vary from cycle to cycle. So if you have a couple of days variance, you know, some days, it's some cycles, it's 27 days, some cycles, it's 32 days, and you have a, a range of a couple of days variance there, then that's totally fine. It's when you're more than, you know, eight to 10 days different. So, you know, one cycle, it's 27 days. The next cycle, it's 45 days. The next cycle, it's 60 days. That's when it's a big problem. Like that's when it's actually a problem in terms of the length. So a little bit of variance is totally normal. So there's a lot of women out there that think, oh, my cycles are irregular because sometimes it's 31 days and sometimes it's 26 days, but that's actually completely within the realm of normal. And in terms of just how you calculate the cycle length, what what is that? Is that from day one of your period to the day before your period? Is it like, just in case there's anyone listening going, how do I calculate my cycle? Yes. Thank you for that. So yes, day one of your cycle is the first day of your period. And it's the first day that you actually have your true menstrual bleed. So there's a lot of women that have some spotting. So uh, especially coming off of hormonal contraceptives, uh, when you're, you know, your body's struggling to organize itself again in terms of hormonal balance and production, um, it's common to have a several days of spotting. So spotting is not menstruation. And so when you actually get into your flow, like it's like flowing and you actually have to do something about it. <laughs> so you got to like reach for something, then that's the first day. Um, and so to kind of take you through the stages of the cycle. So in terms of menstruation, a normal period is considered to be anywhere on average about four to six days, but anywhere from about three to seven. So if it's less than two days, then that's, you know, lower than what we would consider to be normal. And then if it's more than seven days or if it just never stops, like it just keeps trailing on and like all these days of spotting, then that's also outside of the, the range of normal. And as we mentioned already, pain is not a normal part of menstruation. So although it is very common and many women experience pain with menstruation, it is not normal. It is a sign that there is a problem. <laughs> so let's just put that out there. So I think Rebecca, in your case, your pain was not normal. It was a sign that you have endometriosis. Um, and it was only because of you had to, endometriosis can only be diagnosed uh, for the most part via surgery. So there's a lot of women out there with un undiagnosed endometriosis, but that's only one of the, you know, several reasons why she may experience pain. Um, so in addition to that, um, after you have your period, you would expect to have a few dry days, and then you would expect to have about three to six days of, of cervical mucus that leads up to ovulation. So in a normal healthy cycle, ovulation is not always going to happen on day 14. I think that's another myth. If your cycle 
length can vary, then so can the day of ovulation. So ovulation, um, you know, could could happen anywhere from day 12 to day 20. But it ultimately what we're looking at is the whole picture, all of these factors together. I, I never focus on the actual day of ovulation. So what we're looking for is several days of mucus leading up to ovulation. Um, but in a healthy cycle, we'd expect that to be about three to six with at least one day where you have clear, stretchy mucus. Um, if you have like a week of mucus, two weeks of mucus, and it just goes on and on and on, if you have some sort of mucus every single day, that can be an indication of an issue because we would expect to see mucus only on those, uh, you know, three to six days leading up to ovulation. And then after, like, and then ovulation is important. <laughs> so if you're not ovulating, that is a sign of a problem. Um, and then after ovulation, the luteal phase is something that we look at as well. The luteal phase is the period of time between ovulation and your next period. And so in a healthy cycle, we would expect that to be at least 10 days, but we want to see that more like 11 to 13 or 14 days. Like we would expect to have a healthy, robust luteal phase. So then if your cycle does not fall within those parameters, if it falls outside of those parameters, and that there's any, I mean, you can see how this would be very useful because if you have this idea of what a normal cycle is, then it's quite obvious if your cycle doesn't fall within those parameters. And that is where we start the conversation of, okay, you know, what can we do? How can we support your body so that your period and your menstrual cycle improves and the parameters are more into the normal ranges? And once you start learning about this stuff, you realize just, it's so clear. But I had no idea. I I have come up through that era where every day was a fertile day. If you had unprotected sex, you would fall pregnant, that kind of mantra. And I've realized, thanks to you, that actually I've got a really small window where I could fall pregnant. And I've spent years of my life, you know, well, not that I've been off the pill for long periods, but the times that I have come off the pill um, or whatever hormo hormonal contraception I was on and if I was in a relationship, I'd just be terrified that I would be falling pregnant at any moment in time because I just thought anything could happen to me. It, like every day is a fertile day and um, and it's not. And uh, it's really it, it's really nice to have that kind of freedom and, and to be able to relax a little bit and not be like, oh, my gosh, am I – Am I a walking pregnancy time bomb? Um, and I think that anybody <laughs> that wants to, to really learn more about their um, this whole their cycle and their fertility window and everything, investing in a, a coach like yourself, Lisa, who can take them through that and really you know answer all of those questions, I think is so worth the investment because you learn so much more than say reading books or I mean reading books are good, but when someone can answer your specific questions and the other thing that I found really interesting was I have observed cervical mucus over my life, but I never knew what it was because it's not like anyone comes to you when you start menstruating and says, okay, so you're going to see this stuff on your undies and this is what it means. Most of the time you're like, Ugh, what is that stuff? <laughs> Where's that come from? I had a shower today. Why is that there? And, um, mm -hmm. and it, you're a bit grossed yeah. out by it. And then I learned through your program to actually – you know, I'm I'm actually really excited when I see it. I remember the first time with the program when I really noticed my first proper cervical mucus observation, and I was so excited I couldn't wait to tell the group about what I'd just <laughs> discovered. And now I, you know, now I'm I kind of celebrate it, and I am really proud to have this um, this cycle. I'm really proud of my body for the fact that it can still have a cycle. Uh, I'm 39, so I'm coming to the end of it. I wish I'd learned about this many, many, many years ago. It would have saved so much angst and anxiety and, and I would have been able to deal with my cycle um, more than I've been able to. You know, I'm kind of coming at it at the in the twilight years rather than in the at the early de early years of it, um, but it it really is an, a fantastic and fascinating window into the health of the body. Like well, I couldn't agree more. There's just so much of what you said. You know, I um, for those of you who are listening who have heard of fertility awareness and maybe have even read "Taking Charge of Your Fertility" by Tony Weschler. I interviewed Tony Weschler. That was a really exciting moment for me. It was like, sweet, I get to interview Tony Weschler. <laughs> but um, so, so I had her on the show, and um, I'm pretty sure it was Tony because sometimes I get confused. But 
she shared her experience of going to the doctor like every month thinking she had a yeast infection. This is not an uncommon experience. Someone listening has actually experienced that where they literally thought they had a yeast infection every single month. And, you know, it it really depends on the physician. Some physicians know about cervical mucus and they, you know, other physicians are going to do a full on STI test for you and be confused every time it's coming up and it's coming up blank. And others may actually tell you, no, 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 that's just your cervical mucus. But I always, I always wonder, you know, because it's just like you said, we're taught about our periods, but often not even in the best way. Yeah. Um, I also was taught that you could get pregnant on every single day of your cycle. And so part of the reason that I I do these programs is because you can read stuff in a book, but ultimately there's a lot of deprogramming that has to happen before you can actually, first of all, believe that it's possible to have unprotected sex where your partner ejaculates inside of your body and you can't get pregnant So that's a big shift um, because, you know, some of the listeners are like, yeah, whatever, this this woman is is crazy. Like, I don't believe it (laughs) because that's what we were taught from when we were all small. I have never met a woman who wasn't taught this, um, especially within my age bracket. Um, So getting to that stage, just that you can even just believe it. I feel like at first it's really interesting and really exciting, but it quickly turns to anger and frustration, which is and, and a sense of outrage, which is like, how is it possible that this amazing um, cycle could be going on in my body? And I could have no idea. How is it possible that I'm, I could only get pregnant for about a week out of each cycle literally about six days that you could actually get pregnant. Um, And then of course, a couple of days on the end of it for security purposes. But how is it, how is it possible that all my life I could have thought the irony is that it's men that are fertile all the time. Men are the ones that are constantly producing sperm and they're the ones that are fertile hundred percent of the time. But for women, there's only about six to nine days in the cycle that pregnancy is possible. That's it. And outside of that window, you can't. It's impossible. Hey guys, do you feel completely overwhelmed when it comes to figuring out what you can eat that's suitable for a SIBO diet? I know that I felt so overwhelmed at the start of my SIBO journey. And let's be honest, eating for SIBO can be challenging. It can downright suck at points. You've already got so much going on. You've got your treatments. You're trying to remember to take all your medications and your supplements. And not to mention all of the daily symptoms that you have to experience. The pain, the bloating, the constipation or diarrhea or both, and the brain fog and exhaustion. The list just goes on. Having someone else take that hassle away from you for planning your food can make your day just that little bit easier. And this is where I've come to your rescue. I've developed SIBO meal plans just for you. They take all of the stress away from planning your SIBO daily food intake. They're based on the SIBO biphasic diet by Dr. Narala Jacobi, and each meal plan is just for the specific phase it relates to. So you may be on phase one restricted or phase one semi-restricted or phase two reduce and repair, and there is a meal plan just for you. We've got 14 days of SIBO-friendly meals and recipes included. There's weekly shopping lists. There's handy hints and tips to make cooking easier. And every recipe is 100% gluten-free. The recipes are low-grain. We only use a little bit of rice or quinoa in the recipes depending on what phase you're following, of course. All the recipes are low carbohydrate, very low dairy, low sugar, and there are low FODMAP options included. The great news is that you can download it instantly and you can get cooking today. If you'd like to know more about the SIBO meal plans, head to thehealthygut.co forward slash SIBO hyphen meal hyphen plans or head to the show notes from today's episode and just click on the link there. 
I hope you enjoy the meal plans, guys. I know it's going to save you so much time, energy and effort and help you be compliant to your SIBO diet as you go through your treatment. Now let's get back to the show. It's quite shocking to learn that after years of being told you, you know, be careful. With my family, with my dad's side of the family, um, the message that always came to from my mum was, your father's side of the family are fertile like rabbits. You will fall pregnant <laughs> just looking at a man. You have to be very careful. You come from fertile women. <laughs> and so that was dropped into me from a very young age. Like the worst thing you could do is be a teenage mum and, you know, just that kind of fear factor around pregnancy. And and so as I started to become sexually active, it was like, oh, my God, I'm just going to be the walking pregnancy time bomb. Um, and 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 it going back to something you mentioned, um, you know, I'd share a lot with my listeners, with my clients. So here we go, people. Here's a lot of information about to come at you. But I was, I was going to the, the doctors for my, you know, uh, regular pap smear. Because I had precancerous, uh, precancerous cervix, I had to do a pap smear every 12 months for about 10 years. So you know, I felt like I was always in there. And then I had endometriosis. And, you know, there was always someone looking at in my bits, it felt like. There was always someone poking and prodding me. And I had gone to the GP and I must have just been at the kind of peak of my fertile window. I I must have had a period of time where I was off the pill. And she does the pap smear and then she's like, whoa, you must have, you like you've got really bad thrush. You've got a lot of kind of sort of creamy, mucousy type stuff in here. And I was like, no, I feel fine. And she she even pulls out the, you know, that thing that they use to do the pap smear. And she's like, look, look at it. And I'm like, whoa, I don't know what that is. And she's like, do you see this stuff? And I said, yeah, every month I see something like that. And she's like, gosh, I don't know what this is. And she tested it thinking that I had a terrible case of thrush and it it wasn't because it was cervical mucus. Um, But she was amazed and she was my primary care physician. Which just and, and a woman, and it just goes to show that you know our even our doctors don't know a lot. And I've had conversations with doctors who, when I asked them, you know, I've been on, I was on the Depo Provera injection, which stopped my periods completely for years, pre- predominantly the whole time I was in London. Once I knew I had endometriosis, and I said to the specialist, "Is there any risk?" Like, what am I doing to my body by completely stopping my cycle? And she said, well, you don't want to fall pregnant, do you? And I said, well, not at the moment. And she said, well, then you don't need to have a period. Why do you need to worry about having a cycle when you're not trying to fall pregnant? And I thought, oh, okay, well, I won't worry about my cycle. Um, And I've had a client of mine who had a very similar um, conversation with a doctor. She, um, her period stopped. um, And I would like to talk about that with you, what happens when periods stop and you're not on any contraception, any hormonal contraception. And she asked her doctor, well, I haven't had a period in nine months. Is there anything I should be worried about? And the doctor said, well, you're not trying to fall pregnant. Don't worry about it. Whereas mm-hmm. now I can see that the that having a healthy cycle is actually, like you say, is one of the key vital signs of health in a female body. Mm-hmm. Well, there's, yeah, there's so much to unpack there. Um, your, I just wanted to touch real quick on the story about the doctor. So first of all, it's not a surprise to me that your doctor doesn't know about cervical mucus because unless a woman has learned about fertility awareness, no one knows about cervical mucus because no one tells us about it. And, um, and also I just wanted to point out as well that most women at some point take the pill, you know, not every woman is on hormonal contraceptives of some kind, but most women at some point of their lives have taken hormonal contraceptives. Even myself, I have. Um, for painful periods when I was younger. And so a lot of doctors who regularly do PAPs are doing PAPs on women who don't have mucus because when you're on hormonal contraceptives, they dry up your mucus. So it's very possible that she just has never really seen it because, right? Because yeah. the, the women who are getting their PAPs are, are not having it. Um. So to touch on why, so that's something that, again, is near and dear to my heart. It's very interesting how quick in our modern paradigm, our modern medical paradigm, um, how quick we are and how quick 
physicians are. And there's a number of, you know, physicians who have wrote about this. For anyone who's listening, just Google menstrual suppression and you'll get an eyeful. And so there's a number of practitioners uh, who just believe that there's no purpose of there's no reason for us to, to menstruate. There's no reason for us to, to ovulate if we're not having children. And the sad thing is that from a completely different perspective, so I'll take this from a different angle, there's a movement towards health that's going on right now. I think everyone is kind of aware of that. Anyone listening to this podcast knows that there's a movement towards health. So we have a generation of women who are, you know, running out to their local, um, local farmers markets. We are, you know, buying organic produce. We're looking for hormone meat, hormone-free, you know, meat and dairy products. We're really focusing on our diet. We're taking supplements. (laughs) We are detoxifying our homes. We're, you know, choosing natural beauty products. We're, you know, getting rid of the xenoestrogens. We're drinking out of, you know, BPA-free glass cups and things like that talking about endocrine disruptors and really concerned about our endocrine system. We're concerned about our thyroid health. We're concerned about our hormone balance and we're taking the pill. (laughs) And so there's a huge disconnect there because we are not really recognizing that your ovaries. So the natural and normal function of your ovaries is connected to our entire endocrine system because we as women came fully assembled So I think because the medical scientific model is based on the male body, even to this day, a lot of drugs are tested, you know, primarily on men. And so we think of men as the standard and men don't have ovaries, they don't have this menstrual cycle. So we just assume that it's just this optional side feature that isn't part of (laughs) our actual body functioning, except that it's central to it. So when we talk about, you know, thyroid function, when we talk about hormone function, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, cortisol, um, melatonin, all of these things are connected. And so what hormonal contraceptives do specifically is they stop your ovaries from producing your hormones. And you could go so far as to say that it's a, it's like a form of female castration. So, um, most women I know who have been on hormonal contraceptives believe that the pill gives it, it, you know, it mimics pregnancy. That's what we're told. We're told that it mimics pregnancy and therefore our body thinks we're pregnant and that's why we don't conceive. But that's not what it does. So pregnancy is a, a natural hormonal state, like a natural normal hormonal state. So when you get pregnant, your progesterone and your estrogen, your natural progesterone and estrogens, they rise and they continue to rise and they stay quite high throughout your entire pregnancy. When you're on hormonal contraceptives, you're still producing a small amount of your natural estrogen and progesterone. It's just that (laughs) if you were to compare the hormone profile, it doesn't look like a woman who's pregnant. It actually looks like a woman who's in menopause. And if you think about some of the symptoms that women commonly experience on hormonal contraceptives, like um, vaginal dryness and um, low libido and things like that, um, the hormonal contraceptives interfere with a number of hormonal processes in the body. Um, But I think that that is a helpful starting point. So when you shut off a woman's ovaries, it puts her into a chemical menopause. And when you're not ovulating, you're not producing your body's natural progesterone. So of course, there's synthetic progestins in hormonal contraceptives, but it's not the same as your, the, what your body produces. When you're not producing progesterone, that has an impact on your breast health. It has an impact on your heart health. It has a, an impact on your bone density. <laughs> it, it just, it, that is just the tip of the iceberg. And so I think I'll just pause there, Rebecca, because obviously I could go on about it all day. <laughs> but I feel like it's really important for us to start to really recognize that this natural process of ovulation, which is really what we always think about our period because it's red and it's obvious and it's like the, it gets the best PR, but really you don't have a true period unless you ovulate. So what we're really doing is we're, you know, canceling out ovulation and ovulation is a part of our natural endocrine, our natural healthy endocrine function. And so by stopping that, we are actually, it's, if for anyone who's concerned about endocrine disruptors, hormonal contraceptives are 
it's like what you said earlier, which is like taking a sledgehammer to the ovary. Hormonal contraceptives are like an atomic bomb, right? But we're worried about BPA from a, from a, a you know, a plastic bottle. And then we're taking the A-bomb every day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I remember listening to you talk about how it was more like going into menopause than it was being in a pregnant state. And I was shocked because I thought that a, a woman, none of us want to be in menopause just yet, even though we we talk about, oh God, stupid periods. I wish, you know, I wish they'd hurry up and finish. Uh, let me tell you, at 39, now that I am looking down the barrel of this next phase and going in, you know, I don't know when I'll go into um, pre-menopause, but it's starting to, I'm starting to like not want it because even though I've had horrific periods, I'm really proud now of my cycle and, I, and I'm proud of being a woman and finally learning so much more about my body and I, and I don't actually want the cycle to end. So... Um, I wish I'd known more about, you know, just the impact that the pill was having on me. Now, would I have made a different decision? I don't know. Um, I may well have still made that same decision. And I, and I, I guess what I want to get across is that we're not saying that no one should ever take a hormone contraception. I think they can be incredibly useful at periods of time. But I, I want all women to know what they're doing to themselves and be conscious in their decision because I certainly was not conscious in or aware of the impact that that was having on my body until it very, very recently. And I'm kind of cross that I just got hoodwinked by the marketing and the kind of general brushing off that so many doctors do of, oh, what would you know, you silly woman? Um, I have the medical degree and you are nothing kind of approach that so many doctors take with us mere mortals. Um, (laughs) And, you know, I, I just went along with it because I thought, well, that's what you do. Everybody, everybody. Everyone goes on the pill and everyone with endo should be on the pill, surely. Um, Let's talk about, so we've talked about what a kind of healthy cycle looks like. What happens um, when your period stops and there's no real reason for it? You're, you know, you're in and you're not going into menopause. You're still young. Well, you should shouldn't be in menopause, perhaps you're in your 20s or your 30s um, and you've realised, oh, I actually haven't had a period for months. What's happening um, when that occurs? Because that is quite common with people with SIBO. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a couple of different, um, you know, physiological reasons why that can occur. But um, to start the conversation off, I feel like it's helpful to consider that, you know, like we've been talking about, your menstrual cycle, regular ovulation is a sign of health. So the first thing is when you when you stop ovulating and therefore stop menstruating because you can't have one without the other, um, that is a sign of a problem. So I feel like <laughs> we know that by now, but I just want to stress that. Um, there's a number of different reasons why a woman's period may stop or a woman may stop ovulating. And essentially what's happening is something is interfering with the communication that's supposed to be happening. So in order for ovulation to happen, so, you know, a little biology lesson, but at the beginning of the cycle, um, your, your ovaries are where your reproductive hormones are produced. So your ovaries are where estrogen and progesterone are produced. So, and they're produced as your follicles grow. So what's supposed to happen is that after you have your period, your follicles in your ovaries start to grow and start to develop in response to the communication that's happening from your brain. So in your pituitary gland, you know, it sends out follicle stimulating hormones, so FSH, to your ovaries to stimulate them, to tell them, hey, okay, guys, wake up. It's time to start making some eggs. Let's do this thing. And so, um, What happens is in a healthy cycle, your ovaries are receptive to that follicle stimulating hormone. And then that triggers them to start producing the follicles. That's where eggs are produced. And as they mature, they produce more and more estrogen. And eventually, when we get to the stage where you've produced a certain amount of estrogen, your estrogen levels peak, that is what sends the feedback back to your pituitary. So it's this whole system, just like the thermostat in your house, where it's this feedback loop. And when everything's going great, then um, then it, it operates. But what happens is your ovaries are highly intelligent. So although it's very frustrating when your cycles are not cooperating, it's actually a sign of your body trying to protect yourself. 
And so in times of stress, and stress we often think of in a certain way, but there's a lot of different things that can cause stress. So I think most of us are familiar with the concept that in order for our periods to start in the first place, we need to be of a certain body weight, you know, you have to have a certain BMI. So for women who are over exercising, under eating, um, if for women who have eating disorders, it's not uncommon or just super heavy exercise routines. I think we're all familiar with the, the concept of a, an Olympian, you know, an Olympic athlete exercising and training really hard loses her period. And we think that that's totally fine and just like a normal part of exercise. So for a woman who loses her period, we have to really look at what's going on. So it could be related to something like over exercise, under eating, too small or too low of a body mass index. It could also be related to other types of stress. Um, it could be related to endocrine dysfunction, thyroid disorders, could be related to polycystic ovary syndrome, which is related to um, the body's, just the way that the body is processing or not processing sugar. Um, so it can be related to diet and it can also be related to gut health. Um, so if you think of a person who has a really serious gut illness or issue, um, and perhaps they're consuming the very foods that are aggravating the gut, that causes a high degree of stress in the body. And so this inter, all of these, um, all of these situations can cause the, cause interference in that normal process, that normal communication process that's supposed to be happening. Um, so some women, you know, you do the testing and then you start to get familiar with all the lingo, like, oh, I have a super high FSH or I have, um, you know, high, high insulin levels or I have high glucose or whatever it is. But essentially in layman's terms, it is different areas of different things causing stress in the body that are disrupting the endocrine system and preventing the communication that's supposed to be happening between your brain and your ovaries. Your ovaries are highly intelligent. They're looking around going, you know, this is not a good time to procreate. Like, I don't even have enough energy to, to, to have the appropriate amount of fat on my bones today. Like, I don't even have the appropriate amount of food to do the basic tasks that I need to do. Um, the gut is totally inflamed and there's like you know, there's bleeding in the gut and, you know, we're, we're being, we're under attack, we're under attack from the dairy and the, glu the, the gluten, whatever it is, your body is, has established that this is not a good time to reproduce. And so those, that should give you kind of a general idea of, um, of what's happening and also an appreciation for our bodies and how intelligent they are or how intelligent it is to recognize stress and prevent the most stressful possible thing, which is creating a human being in your body. Yeah, it's pretty incredible, really, isn't it? <laughs> and I think that hopefully, <laughs> um, you know, for those that are listening that are thinking, oh, that's me, I haven't had a period in some time, I hope that that might give some explanation as to why your body may have, um, you know, shut down shop, so to speak, around, you know, it's like, okay, it's, now is not the time for us to be making babies. We're just going to focus on all the other stuff that we've got going on right now. Um, conditions I, I hear commonly that um, women experience who have SIBO are endometriosis. Endo and SIBO seem to just go hand in hand with each other. Um, you know, I, I don't know the stats. I don't know that there has been a study on it, but, but anecdotally, I can talk about the people I speak with and endo seems to be a very common factor for women. Um, also polycystic ovary syndrome or PCOS, um, acne can be problematic, is people having issues with their thyroid. Um, you know, how is this all connected with our fertility and also what's going on with gut health? Well, that's I think a very broad question. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> apologies I think, for that. <laughs> no, that's okay. And it's kind of it's kind of similar in the sense with the last question, which is that you could tell that I was going talking about all these different reasons because there's not one like you can't say, Oh, I lost my period and be like, Oh, I know exactly why, without looking at your anything and talking to you. Because there's so many different factors that can can lead to that type of result. So you have to always take a look and find out. I think the the key to answering that question, it kind of lies in the way that we think about our fertility. And typically we think about our fertility as separate from everything. So 
in one of my interviews, I interviewed Dr. Thomas Cowan, and he's a very interesting man. He's done a lot of work. Uh, his latest book is about the heart and um, the real cause of heart disease. So he has a lot to say about illness and what illness means in the body. And I think that when we, you know, we typically think about illness, what we talked about on that podcast episode was that we typically think of whatever our body is doing to try to fix the situation, we think of that as the illness. So if I contract some sort of virus and I get a fever, I think the illness is the fever. (laughs) But the fever is the body heating up my situation to kill the virus. So in our culture, we have a habit of looking at the actual, like your, what your body's trying to do to fix a situation as the actual illness, as opposed to really understanding what's happening. And so like, the, you know, if I take the example of fertility, if we think about what a healthy body is supposed to be like, a normal healthy body, a normal healthy body is fertile. So if you're having challenges with fertility, in in the podcast episode, it's like my favorite example. But basically what he said was, um, if you just stopped having bowel movements, like you literally just stopped. Like, (laughs) I used to have bowel movements when I was a kid and now I just don't have them anymore. Obviously, that's ridiculous. Like if you went to the doctor and like, I haven't had a bowel movement in six months, like there that's an emergency like that is we we know this but for some reason with fertility we have a completely different idea like we think that um we kind of think it's normal to have fertility problems because it's so common now we don't realize how intimately our fertility is connected to our health so i feel like that is kind of the intro to the question of like how how are these things connected they're <sighs> endometriosis um Many practitioners are, you know, have spoken about how it is. Um, many practitioners think it's an it's an autoimmune disease, so it's a, a sign of immune dysfunction. Um, I had a surgeon on the podcast, um, and he specializes in the area of fertility. And what was really interesting, because I'm not a surgeon, so I'm never going to see endometriosis, like in the flesh. And so he, as a surgeon, shared with me a whole bunch of pictures, which I have on the website, but um, on that, in that episode, but he shared um, pictures of what endometriosis looks like. And so in those pictures, what I saw is that endometriosis, he called it disease tissue. So some, some of the pictures, it looked like black. So the tissue, like, you know how, if you were to imagine like looking inside your endometrial cavity, you would imagine that it would be like pink and red, but the endometriosis tissue was black and some of it was blistered. So like disease tissue. So how do I explain it? And then when you actually like, there's so much talk about endometriosis and how to actually heal it naturally. Endometriosis is related to immune dysfunction. And so one of the things you'd want to do is look at, you know, food sensitivities. You'd want to look at what you're actually putting into your body that's causing this reaction. Um, and so as someone who has overcome a lot of that pain and a lot of that those problems from endometriosis, you know how big of an impact diet, lifestyle changes, and those types of things make on the symptoms of endometriosis. Um, so I guess where I'm going with that is just that um, it's related because endometriosis is a symptom that your immune system is not functioning properly. It's a symptom that you have inflammation in the body it's a symptom that um it's it's like an industrial world disease like if we were eating normal fresh healthy food if we weren't eating processed food if we weren't um consuming foods that we were allergic to and sensitive to and our body wasn't responding with inflammation and all these different types of things and also of course genetic susceptibility uh, to these different types of things based on what our ancestors used to eat and all those types of things it's a it's a reflection of what's of, of that and so what that means is that when you make shifts and improve those your fertility naturally improves as well it's so inextricably linked and it's so connected um and I've, I spoke a little bit about how gut issues show up on the charts as well. Like it's, 
it's hard to explain it because I've seen it so much. So, but all I can tell you is that if the gut is messed up, the chart is messed up. Like these, it's like a mirror. As soon as you start to sort out and, you know, address those types of things, you see the shift in the chart. So I would say that it's linked because it's, it's like one in the same, like your chart literally does reflect your health. And yeah, I don't even know what else to say. It's, it's so apparent. It's so, it's just this amazing tool that we have at our disposal, but most of us have never heard of and we don't know about. Mm. And my own um, sort of journey um, as a young woman to today was at, at 11 when my, um, when I started menstruating, I developed terrible, terrible, terrible acne all over my face, neck, chest, arms, and back. It was everywhere. It was horrific. I hated it. I was so depressed from it. And then I had terrible periods. So, um, you know, my whole system was out of whack. Um, I've had food intolerances and sensitivities since birth. Uh, I was eating the classic Western diet with lots of gluten and grains and lots of carbs, really low fat, medium protein. Um, When I uh, returned to live in Australia after my time in the UK and I had endometriosis, I knew I had endometriosis, I'd just been in for yet another laser um, surgery to remove adhesions. That's really when I started to become quite interested in diet and I stripped out the gluten and dairy predominantly. Um, I then went, um, I started doing the blood sugar, um, sorry, the blood type diet. And then I moved more paleo and before discovering that I had SIBO. So that whole journey of about uh, six years saw me eat better quality food um, over that period of time and reduce out the processed food, really reduce the amount of alcohol that I was drinking reduce out sugar and all the rest, um, to where my diet is today, which is predominantly just a whole foods, natural diet. I'm moving, I kind of now live more in that low carb, high fat zone. Um, and now that my body gets really good quality fuel from my nutrition, my, all of my symptoms are vastly improved. My inflammation is, is, um, quite dramatically reduced. Uh, I've, I went and did food sensitivity testing. So I stripped out the foods for quite a long period of time and then slowly reintroduced some and others. I was like, I don't need to eat them ever again. Um, and uh, I've really found that my symptoms have improved enormously to the point where, you know, I've gone from being bedridden and, bedridden and vomiting from my period starting to there are days or um, months now where I'm surprised. I'm like, oh, here it is. Um, now, now that I chart, I know pretty clearly when it's coming, um, and that's great. It doesn't. I don't get those surprises anymore. But even still, I can, um, you know, have a period commence. I do not need to touch painkillers, and that is an enormous difference in how I can live my life and the quality of my life from what I was doing before. But it hasn't been one thing that I've done. It's been an entire lifestyle change. Um, which has obviously been very supportive to my overall health. Mm -hmm. Well, and that speaks to the power of, of diet and lifestyle changes. I feel like we're often taught that um, with something like endometriosis, the only way to, to treat it is surgery. And obviously sometimes surgery is, is absolutely required just like with endometriosis, um, you know, I, I would not wish that type of pain on anybody. And so sometimes as a, a temporary measure, uh, hormonal birth control is something that, you know, like it makes perfect sense because of that type of, um, that type of pain. Um, and I've had practitioners on my show talk about how sometimes supporting women who have endometriosis, they'll have a protocol that they start three months before they come off of hormonal contraceptives such that they can minimize the pain and the inflammation when they're coming off of it. You know, so they're setting themselves up to actually be able to, 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 to be able to handle it. Um, but just to speak to what you said in terms of the power of diet and lifestyle changes to improve those symptoms, I feel like, you know, it's, it's similar to the point I was getting at, which is that these signs and symptoms, this is your body's way of trying to tell you that something's wrong. 
Um, so the first thing is for us to understand, like, it's not normal to have pain and anguish. And so if we're having that type of pain, our body is trying to tell us something. It's trying to tell us that that, that something's wrong. We're doing something wrong um, to be causing that degree of pain and inflammation. And so um, by, and, and I can relate similarly to your experience personally, because, uh, you know, I no longer need pain medication when I have my period. And for years, there was no period without me. It was me and Advil. We were, we were friends <laughs> and I didn't go anywhere without Advil. <laughs> Actually, the other day I found Advil in my car. Um, in the glove box. I forgot it was there. I literally had to have Ad- Advil everywhere just in case I ever had my period because I wouldn't be able to, to function. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I can relate similarly because for me over the years, I also cleaned up my diet quite a bit. Um, you know, I, I feel like there was a couple things that made a huge difference. So one was that I stopped consuming regular meat that has all of the hormones and all of that kind of stuff and the antibiotics and all that. So, um, you know, although I don't buy every vegetable known to human beings organic, all of the meat that we eat in this house is hormone free and, you know, most of it is local. Um, In addition to that, I don't eat commercial you know, dairy products for the most part, because again, they're, they're stacked with the hormones and the antibiotics, same idea, um, and highly inflammatory. So I actually do consume dairy products, but they're from, they're like directly from a farm, they're unpasteurized. And like, I could go into that, but I I will spare you. Um, So there's a number of changes that I made. In addition, I also really cleaned up my house, got rid of the xenoestrogen exposure. So everything with a scent, I got rid of all my like mango scented lotions and all of those types of chemicals, all of the, um, and I feel that that made a really big difference in my cycles, uh, getting rid of the laundry detergents and the soaps. And I know it's a really big ordeal to even think about going through your house and getting getting rid of all that stuff, you know, switching out your beauty products and all of those types of things. But um, all of those things set you up for hormonal disruption. All of those chemicals, they, you're, they're not estrogen like your body produces, but they they mimic estrogen. So the, the chemical structure is close to enough to estrogen that it acts like an estrogen in your body. And so it really disrupts your hormonal profile and sets you up for, um, you know, pain and inflammation, things like that. So I can really relate to what you're saying and coming from a perspective of, you know, this is your body's way of telling you that something's wrong. Um, really looking at your diet, really paying attention to any food sensitivities. When you're sensitive to food and you consume it, it causes inflammation in the body. And that inflammation can show up in a number of different ways. For some women, it can delay their ovulation and it can really interfere with their menstrual cycle in that respect. For others, it can really interfere with their cervical mucus production, all that kind of stuff. Um, And then for others, it can cause a great deal of pain, inflammation, and worsen and stimulate some of those endometriosis symptoms. So um, there's so many layers to it, Rebecca. Like we could just talk about. (laughs) There um, are. And it's like going into, (laughs) it's like thinking about deep space when you start going down these rabbit holes. And um, anyone that wants to learn more about the kind of chemical load in the body, I did a, um, I've got a great interview with Cara Little. Uh, So check that interview out because we kind of dive deeply into that. But um. One question I've got for you and, and um, before we finish up is um, pain is really common for us people with SIBO, um, but pain is also common for people with endometriosis and PCOS and other um, reproductive issues. Is there any way that you can tell that your pain is digestive related versus reproductive related? Um, I think that there's a couple of ways that you can tell that it may be um, reproductive related. So with endometriosis in particular, one of the ways to, one of the ways to actually, um, it's kind of like one of those diagnostic, like, could it be endometriosis or could it not? Uh, women with endometriosis, depending on where it is. So the one caveat is that there are women with endometriosis that have no pain because it really depends on where it is. So there's women that have literally no pain and they're riddled with endometriosis. So I'm just going to put that out there. Um, Cases of unexplained fertility when, you know, everything looks totally fine and they're not conceiving. um, No pain, but, you know, 
laparoscopic surgery is done and wow, we've got all this endometriosis. Um, But women who have endometriosis and do experience pain, a few of the telltale kind of things to look for is that it's not only, the pain is not only around your period. So um, many women will experience pain with intercourse or pain at different types of the different times of the cycle. So not just around their period, but they'll have pelvic pain at different times, pain with intercourse. Um, And I would say, how do you tell it's not digestive pain? Um, You would probably know more about how digestive pain in particular presents. Um, But I feel as though it's, it's kind of looking at that pain throughout the cycle, pain that is not always at, in your, um, around your period and also pain with intercourse. Those are some key telltale signs in the, you know, pelvic related pain that it could be endometriosis and it could be reproductive in nature. Um, and even with uh, PCOS or in general, if a woman's having issues with cysts, sometimes the cysts can be really painful. So you can have these pains around ovulation or pains throughout the cycle um, that are really, really, it can be really, really painful. Um, again, not related to period pain, but then related to reproductive health. Does that help to answer that question? Yeah. And I think the key thing is pain isn't normal. We shouldn't, our body is giving us pain signals because there's a reason for it and um, to keep exploring what's going on. That if you feel that you're not getting the answer that you want out of your um, doctor or, you know, whomever you're seeing, keep going, keep looking. There's, you know, the body is giving that signal um, to you clearly because it's asking you to investigate and to, and to, you know, hopefully help it and fix what's causing the pain. And um, I ignored the pain for years and, you know, I've, you know, who knows what I would have been able to do differently with my endo if I'd known about it sooner. But, you know, I had that pain for a reason. So, yeah, investigate. Um, Lisa, you've got a fantastic podcast. So for anyone who's listening who would like to learn more about fertility, and I, you know, I'm always diving in. You've got a lot on of sort of a back catalogue because you've been <laughs> podcasting for a while now. But how can people find your podcast? Well, on any of your podcast players, if you're on iTunes or anything like that, you can just search Fertility Friday. Uh, You can also go to my website, fertilityfriday.com, and you can listen right on the website or, you know, depending on what app you use to listen to podcasts. I just released episode 150, so I don't know when this is going to be released, but at the time, (laughs) we're at 150. So I do have a huge back catalog, and we really cover a lot of these issues in detail. Endometriosis, PCOS, I have a number of PCOS episodes, uh, pain with menstruation, the fertility awareness method in particular. Uh, have a lot of episodes about that Um, diet it just goes on and on and on but ultimately the purpose of the show is to really help you gain a deeper insight into your cycles and also to really deepen into that knowledge and awareness that your cycles are a reflection of your health and so you can actually be an active participant (laughs) in your health (laughs) Yeah. And if anyone wants to go and and start diving deeply into those podcasts, something that I do is that I just go and look what resonates with me that day Um, uh, because there are a lot of podcasts that I still haven't listened to. And that can sometimes be a good way that um, sometimes subconsciously I think our brain will be like, okay, I need you to listen to that topic today because that's that's where I need to steer you. Um, You also have um, an awesome fertility coaching program, which I've just recently completed and I loved it and, and learnt so much. Um, so how can people kind of find out more about um, that program and also, and also just sort of what you do and the, the coaching services you provide? Um, well, what I do, I, I have a couple of programs. So the program that Rebecca was part of, which was super fun. You can imagine how much fun we had together. <laughs> um, <laughs> but the program that we did, it's my group program. So I have uh, my Fertility Awareness Mastery. It's a 10-week group program. And essentially what we do is we meet every week for 10 weeks. And in that time, we go through and really nail down the charting aspects of it so that you can be really confident in identifying your fertile window so you know which days you're fertile, which days you're not. And I have groups geared towards uh, conception and groups geared towards avoiding pregnancy. Um, A huge part of those groups are to really delve into the connection between your health and your fertility and to really 
start to understand what to do when your cycles don't um, meet those normal parameters. Um, I also have my one-on-one coaching program, which is a six-month-long program. It's my fertility management masterclass. And in that program, what we do is we really go into your cycle and your health over a six-month period guided by charting. So we meet monthly, right, cyclically, um, because whenever you make changes to your health, to your diet, we can actually see the feedback in your chart. So this allows us some time to go really deeply into it. So thank you, Rebecca, for giving me the opportunity to, to share that with your audience. And if you want more information, you can head over to fertilityfriday.com slash work with me. Yeah, wonderful. And those links are in the show notes for anybody who's interested. Lisa, it's been great having you on the Healthy Gut podcast today. Thanks so much for sharing all of your wisdom around all things fertility. I know I have personally learned so much from you and will continue to learn from you. Uh, and, you know, wish I'd wish you'd been doing it years ago and I'd known all about it. <laughs> but thanks so much for coming on the show. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. I know I just love listening to Lisa talk. If you'd like to get the show notes from today's episode or connect with Lisa or click on any of the links that she mentioned, she mentioned quite a lot of resources, head to thehealthygut.co forward slash fertility. And definitely go check out Lisa's podcast. I listen to it every week. I love it. There's so much valuable content there. So head over to that and I've got that link in the show notes. And I love hearing your feedback. What did you think of today's episode? Make sure you pop a comment or a rating in iTunes or any of the apps you use to listen to this podcast, you can even head to my website and leave a comment at the bottom of the page. I just love hearing what you think about the show, if you found it helpful, or even if you've got suggestions on future topics or guests. Make sure you uh, share that with me and um, let others know that this is the right podcast for them to be listening to when it comes to gut health, SIBO and all things that are connected with that. And come say hi to us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Pinterest and Google+. We're there. Just look for us under The Healthy Gut. Coming up on next week's show, I'm joined by Heidi Turner and we talk about autoimmunity and SIBO. And this is something that often goes hand in hand. And we talk about why that happens and how that happens and also what you can do about it. So join us next week on episode 49 of the Healthy Gut podcast with Heidi Turner. You've been listening to the Healthy Gut Podcast with your host, Rebecca Coombs. To learn more about the Healthy Gut or our podcast, head to thehealthygut.co forward slash podcast. And as we are fully funding this podcast, if you would like to help support the continuation of this podcast so that we can continue to bring you future episodes, all you need to do is make a contribution at thehealthygut.co forward slash podcast. We would like to thank Belinda Coombs for the production, editing and original music score of this podcast. To hear more of Belinda's music, head to soundcloud.com forward slash Belinda Coombs. The Healthy Gut Podcast is a production of The Healthy Gut. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.